Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Podcast here on the Everything Electric Show. My name is Robert Llewellyn, I am the founder and one of the presenters of the fabulous Fully Charged Show and the equally stunningly amazing Everything Electric Show. And I'm joined here today by someone very special because I haven't seen him for a long time because I've been out of the country, but I'm back in the country now and I'm joined by the fabulous Daniel Caesar. I feel nervous, Robert. It's been so long since we've yeah. we've done this. I think we've we work together all the time. We talk together all the time. But I haven't seen you for a while. So it's been a bit should like, we have a live oh, catch up? Yeah, live. Li- that's what we need is a live catch up of what is happening in the world of well, in the world that we inhabit, which is quite. It, I can't keep up, Dan. I'm not going to lie. I'm. I think it's age related. I've just had a birthday, but there's so much going on, so much changing, so many opinions now on this topic. That it is kind of exhausting. It's been a really strange year and a bit. And I think that uh, I'd like to maybe start off talking about EV adoption. Yeah. Because it has become the hottest of hottest political potatoes yeah. over the last year or so. And suddenly become a topic that isn't just about the technology now. It's much more about hearts and minds. And there's yeah. a lot of misinformation uh, out there. But I think it's important to say that adoption around the world continues to grow grow. yeah and 2023 was the best year ever you don't have to take my word for that you can look at evvolumes.com to see what the figures were from i don't know that site evvolumes.com they feed all the information that's global and they feed all the information on on bevs battery electric vehicles and fevs plug-in hybrid electric vehicles through to clean technica clean technica has a great tab on its website called ev sales i know about that you can keep up to date okay you can keep up to date with monthly uh trends yearly trends etc and i think the important thing is because there's so much misinformation about the EV slowdown to yeah. say that growth is continuing yeah. and quite a rapid rate. There are some markets where it has slowed down a little bit, yeah. but it's a bit like a climate change denier, you know, saying, I don't believe in global warming. Look, it's raining outside of my window. <laughs> the reality is not what's going on outside your no, window at a given picture. moment. It's the bigger picture that's important. So so Bev sales are are still growing around the world with a few exceptions which we might talk about i'm sure like everything electric you'll love our fun packed everything electric expos around the world next up we're in london and harrogate remember energy and transport professionals go for free on the first day but i mean one of the i think the key driving forces behind this which is something i was very obsessed with reading up and catching up about when i was in australia is we've passed a million electric vehicles on the road in this country which i somehow kind of passed me by and that's quite a big milestone because I think when I started this there would have been 10,000 uh, no not even that there would have been 5,000 electric vehicles on the road and most of those were g whizzes in London you know so, so it's a massive change in that time but also globally it's now past 400 million electric vehicles and that includes electric scooters and that has resulted in and that was and i can't remember who it's statista i think one of the statistics people a one percent drop in oil in petrol and diesel sales globally one percent and that's that is about it's, it's a terrifyingly large amount in terms of barrels it's hundreds of millions of barrels a week less but it's only one percent of global use but it's the first time that's ever happened in history and you think There's going to be a little alarm bell dinging in various companies and countries, you know, petro states that we've heard that that's finally a noticeable change because you wouldn't have been able to see it even like five years ago. Maybe if you really studied the statistics, you'd see a tiny drop in petrol sales in certain key gas stations around the world. But, you know, it was irrelevant. But now it's a thing. Well, I mean, denial has got to be one of the most powerful... Yeah, forces in the world, and I think all the while it was just you and your Mitsubishi iMeve originally. <clears throat> the, I thought that had a massive impact. <laughs> the automotive industry wouldn't have been quaking. I remember when um, that guy who runs Tesla, I can't remember his name, uh, he sort of stood up in 2016 and announced the Model 3. Yeah. There were plenty of people in the industry, including myself, said, you know, they should be paying attention in the boardrooms of, of Germany and in Japan yeah. and, uh, and the US to this uh, announcement. But they weren't. They all expected Tesla to go bankrupt. Uh, if you remember, he had to put a, a tent on the side of the Fremont factory yeah. to get Model 3 through production hell. They didn't go bankrupt. You know, he had a good uh, good fun with that particular story. 
But I think maybe last year, for the first time, with those sorts of numbers, I think suddenly there was a blip on the radar. Yeah. This is happening. And that's why we've entered an era now where adoption continues to grow, but distraction it's gets really louder intense, and yeah. louder and louder. And it's very difficult to know when you're in the industry what to do about that. Do you just ignore the distraction yeah. or do you get dragged to it? And I think what we've tried to do with the Fully Charged Show with our Everything Electric exhibitions is to keep promoting adoption. And yeah. then with our Stop Burning Stuff campaign, we've start, tried to tackle some of the uh, distraction. Yeah. But I mean, some of the stories now are absolutely crazy and you've all been in a situation where maybe it's with a spouse let's say for example that they've said something utterly outrageous you weren't expecting and you just don't know how to respond yeah, yeah. and about an hour later you realize what you should have said before well yeah. that's what some of these distraction techniques do you hear this thing or you see it written down yeah. and you look at it and go that's absolutely bonkers but you're so shocked by what's been uttered yeah. you're sort of dumbfounded and you can't respond so it's an incredibly effective tactic, but I'm just keen to say that EV adoption is glow growing all around the world, yeah. continues to grow, will continue to do so. This is a global mega trend. However, the last year have shown us that the war of ideas is heating up. It's going to probably get quite a lot worse yeah. before it gets better. And it is still bizarre. I find it very bizarre because I've always thought, you know, one of, the, if if anything, in the long list of things that initially attracted me to electric vehicles was the fact that it was a piece of technology. So therefore, apolitical, it didn't matter whether, you know, it wasn't a political statement. And But it's becoming one, which is a real shame. But then we have heard from some Republicans <laughs> who like EVs in, in America. You know, I think that is extraordinary that is that something we could talk about? If not, we don't have to. No, we definitely should and yeah. can. In fact, <clears throat> I think we should save the talk about uh, Trump and Biden and America to, maybe to the, to the, to to the end on. of this podcast. Okay. Because I've it's, just jumped on it now because it just stayed no, when, it's, when you told me about it. it just, it's a, really, it's a yeah. really interesting topic and I think we are going to maybe get a little bit more involved over there. Yeah. So I'll, I'll save that reveal okay. to later it's on in the podcast. If juicy that's thing okay. to come. So stay till the end. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we, we're, we're really at this point now where you look at all the car companies and we have this, I've spoken about it before in the podcast, this vantage point, this window into yeah. what's going on with the different car companies that very few others have. And um, we've done sessions at our live shows called, you know, which car companies will end up in an electric graveyard. We, we've shifted our tone slightly on those. And this year, they're going to be which, who are going to be the top five right. car companies uh, by 2030. And I think there's some big change ahead. But when you look at Tesla, for example, it's not a news story anymore. No. It's an evolving story. We've seen Cybertruck come out. Ricky did a great episode on Cybertruck yeah. on the Fully Charged show very recently. But they haven't followed up with a more affordable vehicle. That has, to my mind, probably opened up the door even more yeah. for organisations like BYD. BYD will be with us at Everything Electric London in a couple of weeks, so in a week's time, uh, and they will um, be joined by more and more uh, Chinese manufacturers yeah. in due course. We're keeping a close eye on Geely. Right. So Geely have Lotus, Polestar, Polestar Volvo, Smart, and other brands right. within their uh, portfolio. And since we last podcasted, we'll have noticed that Polestar now has kind of gone back under the wing of Geely. Yeah. And there's been something of a, and we can only speculate, something of a falling out between Volvo and, and, Polestar. and Polestar. Right. Which is fascinating. Yeah. Again, we're big fans of, I think, both brands. Yeah. Um, but when Volvo bought out their EX30, which will have an XL uh, at the end of uh, the week, um, I wonder if people at Polestar, what their reaction would be that to that and vice versa, because yeah. they're effectively becoming competitors. I mean, that EX30 is fairly affordable, yeah. great looking vehicle, but really just nice. to me, I saw it and went baby Polestar. That was my first yeah, yeah. reaction. Yeah. You wonder what, you know, what's going on with the dynamics in, the, in within those companies. And then we're following Rivian very closely at the moment. They've just announced the R2, the R3, yeah. uh, which we uh, got to see uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, recently are they going to make it we certainly hope yeah. that they will but again in the news very recently arrival now are pretty much run out of, of cash 
just read something before we started talking about Fisker having a six month, a six week, excuse me, production pause. Wow. You know, Fisker is struggling. Um, and have we got to a point where that game of musical chairs we've talked about is starting? Yeah. Yeah. I think we we have reached a really kind of critical year or two now yeah. uh, for, for for the car company. So what we're seeing firsthand is is just uh, extraordinary. Yeah, and there's so many things that I that's why I find it hard just to keep hold of all the threads. But the the fact that um, Lucid, you know, was one of those companies. Oh, Lucid, they're going to be amazing, and they are making cars and they are selling them. There's Lucid Lucids on the roads in America, and they're very popular. But they've got this enormous factory in Saudi Arabia that, you know, it's usually those stories are you hear that they're going to plan it and you see the, the CGI rendering of a factory in the desert. They've done it. It's built and it's functioning already. And they are producing cars there that are for the European market and the Asian market. And I go, well, I, how did that happen? They, you know, we normally, we, I, I've, maybe I just missed the announcements, but I, the first time I heard of it was it was open and and producing stuff well industry rumors are that that project is largely bankrolled by saudi oh, arabia no i, I yeah. don't know the, the exact details of that but it strikes me that the winners of this battle royale that started now are going to be the ones that make the most cars not yeah. the ones who make the most noise yeah and we're seeing a lot of mass marketing now for these cars which is quite nice to see but at the same time we're also seeing lots of companies waste a lot of money yeah on the mass market, there's lots of people out there who are not yet ready to buy an electric vehicle. So what we try and do with our YouTube channel and our events and the combination of both is bring in people who are either, they're already EV buyers, they're repeat right. buyers, or they are imminent buyers. What we see at the moment is in the UK, 315,000 electric vehicles were sold in 2023. Right. This year might be slightly higher. It'll be probably close. We're running at about 15, 16%. Uh, pure EV sales a, a right. month of the total market. But that, that 315,000 a year is a tiny, tiny sliver of the overall market. Oh, so yeah. mass marketing at the moment in the UK, talking to everyone and spending huge amounts of money on big glitzy activations or, or TV campaigns, you're really trying to actually look for a needle in a haystack, yeah. whereas we've actually got all of the needles are kind of in one place at our live events. So we find the whole market really, really fascinating. I have to say a word for the Japanese manufacturers as well. It strikes me that BMW with its Neuer class of vehicles, yeah. Mercedes, I think VW Group is a big beast and it's quite tough to turn, but they've got lots of good vehicles out now. And a lot coming. A lot, a lot coming. The line, yeah. They're kind of in the mood, I think, and, and, and looking to mass manufacture. It strikes me that the Japanese are if anything, going a little bit further uh, back, I would say. Yeah. So we would love to work more with, you know, Honda, Toyota, yeah. et cetera. But if they're not, if they don't really want to mass market and or sell the vehicles in, in volume, it's it's very, very difficult. Yeah. I haven't seen too many Honda E's on the road no. in the UK, and they've just announced they're not going to stop making it for, for Europe, for example. Right. Um, which shows that maybe it was a cute, but compliant yeah. car uh, back in the day so the japanese i would be really really worried uh, if i was yeah. in uh, a japanese car company i think yeah. it's difficult you've you've given a lot of seeded a lot of advantage to tesla to byd to geely and those those others i mean it's primarily to the chinese you know in a sense that's where i see the competition for, for japanese cars is that the, you know you could look at a byd and go what is that a toyota you know no it isn't <laughs> i mean it should be <laughs> that's the thing it should be a bloody toyota but i mean it does that the, the the, a story I read very recently was about Nissan and Honda working together and doing joint electronics and software, which is, that's the problem for those people, is the people who've made brilliant internal combustion cars for 50 to 100 years, they're really good at it. But when and Honda, totally when Honda and Nissan announce they're going to do something together, what's your gut feel? Is your gut feel, oh, that good, that will be good for them, or is your gut feel, that's a bit strange? I mean, I don't know. I don't know enough about the history of those two companies and how competitive they've been in the past. But it strikes me as well. I mean, Nissan have got quite a lot of experience with electric vehicles over, over a long period of time, so they've made plenty of mistakes. So you sort of hope that they, the combined engineering skill of those two companies could come up with something half decent. And Honda are working as well on the Afila, terrible name, but that's the car with Sony as well. So there's lots of these. Right. 
projects going on, right, but, concepts. Yeah. I, I think the hype cycle is over, and maybe we'll get into that in a bit more detail. I think we're getting to the point where the rubber's hitting the road. Yeah. People want cars that they can buy. I think we see that on YouTube now. The reactions we get when we when we are excited about, well, like the R3, I thought, well, that's amazing. That looks yeah. great. And people go, well, it doesn't exist, so don't tell me about it. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas a few years ago, if we'd come at something that was a bit more conceptual, People sort of gravitated to that. I think now there's more of a desire to, well, what can I actually buy? Yeah. What yeah. can I actually get hold of? What's a realistic uh, prospect for me? And the other thing from our side of uh, the world is that we actually do do events now outside of the UK. Yeah. And that's been just absolutely eye-opening yeah. to go to other countries. It's all very well reading your statistics on EV volumes, but to actually go to the countries and see what's going on is incredible. And yeah. we've, well, you've just got back from Australia, but we delivered everything electric Australia uh, about five weeks ago. And it was extraordinary, wasn't it? Extraordinary, yeah. almost the flip <clears throat> side of what's going on in the UK. It was yeah. very positive. You know, the, the politics is all set up to make the, the EVs succeed. There's real purchasing intent from consumers yeah. out there. It was real really amazing moment to get out there we had chris bowen do you remember yeah, the yeah, minister for energy and climate yes change so we had there. a minister that wanted to be at the event because he knew how relevant it was really spruiking I experienced that in the uk <laughs> really spruiking or talking up yeah. electric vehicles on stage at our show we had uh car companies you know running thousands of, of test drives and that happens at our uk events as well but there was i have to admit to being slightly depressed when i got back off the plane from Sydney and yeah. came back to London because yeah. the Australian market is is flying yeah. to the extent now that we've been asked to do a second show in yeah. Australia, buying several of the other cities out there. Uh, so that's an addition to Sydney and we are seriously considering it. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing. So I'm a regular visitor due to being married to, <laughs> married to one of them, <laughs> those Australians. <laughs> and um, uh, the, the, so the, I kind of, I remember... About six years ago when I was there, seven years ago now, we drove a Tesla Model X from Sydney to Brisbane. And I didn't see another electric car on that journey at all. Didn't expect to, didn't see one. There was a, there were Tesla superchargers. It was a very easy journey. Um, but, you know, it was, just that, it was Tesla. And then when you got into a city, you would see lots of other Teslas or a handful. Now, I did exactly the same journey the other way from Brisbane down to Sydney just before the show. And it was like driving in Surrey in terms of the density of electric vehicles. I mean, in Brisbane, I think Brisbane's got the most I've ever seen. That's unbelievable. It's just the, the sheer quantity. of. But loads of what's different is, yes, there's loads of Teslas, but now there's loads of BYDs, MGs in particular. Those three are the kind of most common. You do see Kias, but they're slightly rarer. But so many, you know, it's a, it's a very, very noticeable change. And everywhere we went... Last year, right across out in the whoop whoop, as my wife calls it, in, in the, out in the bush, where there was one charger at, in the car park of the um, RSL club, the Returned Servicemen's League, which was really awkward to get to. And it was like, well, you're in the middle and it's really hot. Now, there's at the, at the, on the actual motorway, there's a massive array of, of chargers under a canopy. And you go, that's happened in a year. You know, it's, it's a complete transformation. It's way faster than we've ever had it here we we sort of we hobbled for a decade gradually putting in more charges they've done it in 18 months i mean it's extraordinary change there and when we were there we went we met with tesla didn't we but we also yeah. went to byd's new yeah. superstore in alexandria in sydney, in sydney and we had yeah. a walk around there it is it is really noticeable but i think the one thing i took from the trip to australia the show was an incredible success um, was I tried to sort of harness the positive energy because it has been tougher in the UK. The UK yeah. market has been much tougher for a whole range of reasons. It isn't just one the, single reason. Oh no, it's not. And it's really, in a way, nothing to do with electric cars or cars. It's to it, do with the economy. To do with the economy. Yeah. And, and uh, we, could, we could mention the B word. We can mention, you know, cost of living, inflation. You know, I could go on and on and on. We could mention subsidies being kicked away and, and all that sort of thing. But... In Australia, they're actually in the reverse situation. Yeah. And they said to us, we were slightly depressed, glum-looking Brits, they said to us, actually, before our federal election in May 2022, yeah. we were 
despondent yeah. as, as EV lovers because there wasn't enough supply. There was no real policy support. Yeah. Actually, the mood in the country meant you couldn't really talk positively about EVs before people throwing coal at you. Well, I've, I've made that bit up, but you, <laughs> you get the general yeah. idea. And so they said we were despondent as little as, you know, two and a half years ago and how yeah. things have, have changed. They've gone from less than, I think it was 0.1% oh, to 3% yeah. to yeah. 7%. I think the last month was more like 9 or 10%. Yeah, it's extraordinary um, change. Yeah. So they're growing very, very fast. And the irony is that they are potentially going to get up to the same new car EV penetration as the UK by the end of this year. Right. Wow. Whereas we have now stood still effectively yeah. for uh, a good a good two years. So it was an amazing experience. But I think you did right by staying out in Australia to soak up some more positive rays for a bit longer than I did. <laughs> Yeah, I was bullied to by the missus. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. It was great fun. Um, let's go. I want, can we bring in one positive story about yes, the let's, United let's, Kingdom yes. of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Uh, ta- this is a headline in the Guardian newspaper. Tata confirms Somerset will be home to a £4 billion battery factory which is an amazing bit of news. So they've actually said, well, we have to wait till, I know we have to wait till they actually do it, but it does look very positive. So it's Tata, Indian company Tata, are going to build this huge factory in Bridgewater in Somerset, which just for people who don't know the UK at all, it's on a main artery motorway slash freeway slash highway, whatever you like to call it. So it's in, I know the actual industrial estate. I've, we've been to see someone on that, the industrial estate where it's, it's being built, but I can't remember who we saw there a long time ago. But 4,000 jobs in a region that does have quite high unemployment. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not, you know, it's a fairly, it's kind of, I always think of it as a fairly rural area. But, I mean, Bridgewater is a reasonable-sized town. But that is, I'm, I'm happy about that. I mean, I'm delighted to see that news. You know, we've had very high-profile uh, failure of British Vault, British Vault to get off the ground. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Nissan have been... Uh, producing batteries uh, in in Sunderland, Sunderland for yeah. the for their own cars, um, but and the UK from, has been. I've just got to say, people from Sunderland aren't Geordies. So I know I said that on one <laughs> podcast once, and that was wrong. No, I don't think I'll ever forgive you for that. Um, so you know, it it is phenomenal news, and you mentioned the four thousand direct jobs, but it's, yeah, there's going to be loads of others. It's everything there? else. It's yeah. the, how the local economy benefits, all the uh, indirect work there as well. So. It is huge, and I, I have to say that is something of a miracle because if you don't have a lot of policy yeah. framework or long-term certainty, or if your government, let's say, is in the last few months of yeah. its life cycle, you know, why would you invest heavily? And we have seen that kind of money dry up. Yeah, I think it's the long-term patient capital from, I think it's Agratis, who are behind Tata, right. who are behind... JLR that are, are building right. the uh, the factory. I think I might have got the wrong order. I think it's Tata who own a, a gratis, maybe. Yes, but, I can't remember which one um, it is. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, that's, they've almost done that, I think, slightly in spite of uh, the conditions. But no, it's incredibly welcome. But we should have more of that. You know, we want yeah. we want more of that in, in, in the UK. It's yeah. a huge opportunity. You know, I've said on this podcast before, I think we're sitting on a sodium ion opportunity, which again, I think we're in danger of missing if we yeah. don't act quickly enough and uh, Imogen did a great podcast recently with uh, Lena Energy yeah. uh, which is worth uh, checking out as well so from my perspective um, you've got to have that policy framework those signals are really really important one of the first questions we ask now is if someone says to, would you bring everything electric the exhibition to our country or to our state or province first questions we ask is about their politics yeah and about the subsidies the support that there is there, yeah. and the long-term interest, you know, and it does vary as this has become more of a right-left issue. It shouldn't be that way, but yeah. that's that's the reality. Uh, we did a show in Amsterdam last year. Um, they obviously elected uh, Hit Wilders, uh, but on the coal- he can't form a coalition at the no. moment. <laughs> he still hasn't. Has he? um, <laughs> uh, he's unable to. I think he's accepted defeat on, on on that front. But we do understand that the Dutch market is actually going to remove some of its subsidies in under right. a year's time. I just want to add very quickly that all these governments that are removing sub- very, very modest subsidies for renewable energy, electric vehicles, insulation, all those things, they don't, they're not removing them for the fossil fuel industry, which gets 
you know, eye-watering, gut-dropping subsidies from every government in the world. Yeah, it, it's right, because, I mean, frankly, you could sit here and go, well, there's a couple of guys sort of moaning on a podcast about how there's no subsidies yeah. for these kind of liberal technologies that are a bit more <laughs> expensive. But that's the key thing to keep in mind. Those subsidies and those incentives are not being kicked away or removed from no. fossil fuel industries. It really is hobbling what's going on. In the UK, as I say, it's a strange mix of um, different things that have led us to where we are. But we probably should be more like the Dutch market now. We should be over 20% per month of new right. car sales should be pure EV. Uh, and they they aren't. And in fact, at the moment, it's kind of, I think uh, February was 17.7%, but generally it's more at 15 to 16%. Right. There's a lot of fleet car sales that yeah. are propping up the kind of the EV market. The private buyer at the moment has been deterred for a number of different reasons, one of of which is misinformation as well as, of course, general economic conditions. And so we've got to do something about that. But to do that, we do need, you know, some real positive signals around this yeah. market. It's here. It's here to stay. It will yeah. only grow. But the irony is if we don't partake and don't participate in the UK, we'll miss out on all these other opportunities, the direct yeah. jobs, the indirect jobs, the health benefits. I could go on and on and on. So it is one of those things. It's a bit like, you know, trying to stick your finger in a dam it's it's pointless um and so that's where the uk is at the moment and that's i'm sure we'll touch on america uh, in due course as well yeah. so that's one of the things i've become aware of certainly since i've been back from australia is the it feels like the kind of frailty of our economy in this country and all the companies that we've met in the last 10 years lots of startups lots of new innovation and in technologies but i can sense well i know some of them are really struggling and and uh, it's a really difficult environment for them to operate in now. Whereas, it, you know, it felt like four or five years ago, it felt fairly positive and there was a lot of growth and a lot of expansion and a lot of new companies appearing. But is that, has that affected things, do you think? I mean, I think there is... I've seen various hype cycles. Um, yeah. I wasn't close to the dot-com bubble, but we've all, <laughs> but we've we all, all read about that. Yeah, yeah. We all knew about that. Um, I've been promoting clean energy technologies since well for 20 years and i was in my garden office the other day looking at all my old business cards right clearing stuff up and there were dozens and dozens of companies with bright hopes that never made it right Which um is very normal isn't it yeah entrepreneurialism leads to people who think this is a great opportunity they're brave they take risks and obviously for every company that makes it there are dozens that yeah. that don't so it's not new i would say um but certainly at the moment in the uk is going through a, a pretty pretty tough time i think and i think it's quite a useful cautionary tale for all of these markets around the world not to get too overheated yeah so in the uk i would say we've seen certain segments within what we do so obviously we cover electric vehicles of all shapes and sizes and we cover home energy and clean energy too. There are certain segments within that that I think have found it really, really tough, notably e-bikes. Yeah. That's been a really, really difficult market to to inhabit, and not just e-bikes, but bikes in general. Right. Pandemic came along. Huge sales then. Yeah. Huge sales on top of what already was a fast growth market. And what that attracts then is a lot of hype, yeah. A lot of venture capital, a lot of over-optimistic numbers are what can be achieved. And the reality is that the pandemic receded, car culture kicked back in, people got back in their cars. And then obviously e-bikes are great, but they're not necessarily low-ticket items. Some of them are no. relatively expensive. So we've seen the e-bike market cool down very, very dramatically. And we've seen some companies come and go through that process yeah. and it is a i think a very fragile time for for that market similarly we would say with domestic electric vehicle charging has been quite a, a yes. tricky market yeah. over the last year or two and i only mention that really because a lot of money goes into these entrepreneurial pursuits people get very excited about hot sectors but obviously there's only so many things to go around. And in the yeah. UK where you've had EV sales effectively plateau and flatten out, every single one of those domestic EV charger companies would have been working on the basis that the market it's was going, going to massive. grow. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're all going to get a slightly higher percentage because they, you know, 
everyone's just naturally optimistic. Yeah. If you're an entrepreneur, that's what it what it yeah. is to be uh, an entrepreneur. So we've definitely seen some some tougher trading con- conditions, and we definitely talk to uh, lots of companies. Uh, all the time and it, and yeah uh, all I can say without being overly political I think is the UK would really benefit from some positive signals some real support some subsidy around this and on a long-term basis I think the UK is absolutely crying out for that now um, but on a plus side we're going to be in London soon and Harrogate and Farnborough with our events and there are some phenomenally brilliant things to see some yeah. great companies there but there's there's no question you know from from our perspective our london show is going to be i think our biggest launch ever right but i do think in a different set of circumstances it would, it would have, have been, been bigger yeah much bigger still so um we've got some amazing things coming to that show uh you'll be familiar with the fact that we do two theaters different sessions at every show we are trying to run several thousand test drives, many as many as many as ten thousand test drives wow. across the the course of the show. When you, when you think, I just want to go back to the first show in Silverstone where we might have done ten. I don't, I don't know. In the first show, we were scared. actually we didn't do any. We were scared to promote test drives yeah. because we felt like we were going to create more. more there was only about ten cars, yeah. So we were scared we were going to create more demand than we could ever supply. Yeah. Now it's a different story. Yeah. Test drives typically do go in the first two or three hours of every show, yeah. but the manufacturers are often geared up with 10, 15, 20 cars, yeah. so they can potentially so do as many as a thousand yeah. test drives, and nothing moves the needle more than people who are interested in buying an EV Get coming with their money, yeah. and they get to try two or three in one go. So that's been incredibly powerful. And then we have our zero carbon kitchen our energy advice zone, uh, brilliant kids zone, because the London show is actually on the right. Thursday, Friday, Saturday oh, no, of Easter. School halls. Massive kids uh, oh, great. kids area this time. Uh, and we are doing a live car review area. Yes. So Imogen, Jack, Elliot, Ricky, Quentin Wilson, ex-Top wow. Gear fame, Rory Reed of Auto Trader, yeah. ex-Top Gear fame. They're all going to do live, doing live car reviews. reviews. They are so, I'm so glad. We've I'm left you doing. off the list, Robert. I know, because I would be so nervous. <laughs> this is the new Renault, it's blue. <laughs> would be an absolute disaster. Um, so that's really, really exciting. We are doing a win everything electric competition as well. Right. People can win a BYD seal. That is amazing. My energy, a- my energy are giving us an amazing home energy bundle. We're giving it away wow. an e-bike. Um, so there's tons of amazing stuff uh, going on at the show. Uh, in London on uh, Thursday the 28th, Friday the 29th, and uh, Saturday the 30th. Just about got that out. Uh, We are uh, now letting energy and transport professionals in for free on day one. Clever. And anyone up to the age of 25 can come in for free as well because we were very worried that our audience is lots of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds. So if you're under 25... Now can come in for for free. On any day? Any day. So we wanted families to be able to... Right. Bring their kids without it costing them a, yeah. them a fortune. We're all reconciled at my age that our kids are going to be living with us until they're about 30 <laughs> uh, in any respect. So we're really looking forward to that. And then we've got loads of good uh, content going on. Too much to mention now, but you are doing quite an exciting electric fireside chat. I am. I'm doing three very exciting Sorry, fireside chats. All three of them are equally Please. good, but is there one you'd like to talk about right now? Well, I'd like to mention all three because I'm very excited about all three. So so um, Ricky Roy is on the first one on the first day and Ricky is such a dude and knows. And also I really do want to find out what's going on in America. He, it's a great opportunity to kind of interview him about the American market and what's happening and he knows that very well. Day two, the Friday, is Hannah Ritchie. Oh. Wait one moment. She's amazing. This is ruined my life because this is her new book, Not the End of the World. It is extraordinary, extraordinary. And she, what terrifies me is she is younger than Imogen. <laughs> Not much, <laughs> but a bit. And she's written this book, and it's uh, the the detail and the, the. So she's a data analyst and does. She's a data scientist, and it's she's been on the podcast. But that's day two, interviewing her and talking to her. And this is. I'm so glad I got this book. I couldn't get it in Australia. I had to wait till I got back. And then on the the Saturday, there's a little known YouTube channel. Not many people watch it. Just hundreds of millions every week. 
um, uh, Colin Furs, who is a, a, an absolute hero of mine ever since I first saw him do it. And we do have quite a lot of connections, even though we've never met. I've spoken to him briefly already, and uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to him. He is just a, a really charming guy and also fascinating what he's done. 12.4, I think it is, million subscribers on YouTube, which is not, you know, which is a thing we, we're not jealous. We aspire to that. That's not bad, is it? That's not, not bad. bad. I don't think this home energy and electric vehicle thing is getting us enough views, Robert, if I'm honest, <laughs> when you listen to that. But a couple of quick things I should mention. I can't wait to, to see that session yeah. with uh, Colin uh, either. But uh, we're going to have more home energy tech at this show than we've ever had at any show before. Oh, brilliant. Which oh, is good. great. Right. And then on the car front, lots of test drives, um, lots of manufacturers there, but also quite a few launches of cars you will not have seen before uh, mm. in the UK and uh, and Europe as well. So I will leave it there. Yeah. And then the team finishes in London, and then we have a few weeks to get ready for Harrogate. Yeah. Which is just a phenomenal show. Yeah. Much more of an outdoor uh, festival and in a the lovely truest atmosphere. sense. Such a lovely atmosphere. show. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver in yeah. September. Well. We'll not sniff at Vancouver. It's a pretty extraordinary place. So yeah. uh, BC Hydro are having us back in for everything Brilliant. electric Canada uh, in September. Then off to Farnborough uh, in again in October. So that's had an 18-month rest, that show. So we're looking forward to doing that again. And then with lots of plans afoot for, for 2025. We haven't announced our exact dates of return to Amsterdam. We do have people interested in taking us to a second show in Australia. In fact, we have lots of interest from all over the world. So we're yeah. picking through that now. Ultimately, the end goal, I think, would be maybe to have as many as 10 of these shows uh, right. around the world. Um, but to do that, you know, we probably need to... We need a slightly bigger team. Bigger team. So we, we will we will probably, you know, we'll probably sell out to Abramovich or uh, yeah, Gazprom. So. Or, Gazprom or, are good. Or Apparently they're somewhere. very benign. Putin, he's just got a big round of support back home. So, no, if we, if we do grow, we'll do it in the right way. But yeah. the ability to showcase these technologies on YouTube and then actually put people in them, whether it's cars or yeah. get people to touch and talk to experts, whether it's heat pumps or solar and batteries, has been such a powerful combination. Yeah. So... We believe that you know it's a, it's playing an, a, an important important role in helping to get these technologies out there and ignore the noises off, ignore yeah. the distraction, and get people to to deploy these technologies as quickly as possible. Yeah. No, I'm really looking forward to. It. I mean, I think some because I think some people assume that uh, because of my involvement in the fully charged show ge generally, I'll know exactly what every single aspect of the live events. <laughs> the actual truth is, like when I walk in the day before we open and I'm walking around with my jaw open going, oh my god I that's the first time I know about how I mean I, you know obviously you've told me many of the things but when I went when I first saw the Sydney show before we opened I just couldn't believe it I mean it was on such a vast scale in, in comparison to what we did the first year well I think it was similar if not slightly bigger to um I might get fact checked on this but it was not dissimilar to the size of Geneva Motor Show which is a show which is probably right getting smaller has diminished quite a lot yeah. nonetheless for the australia year two show to be at that level already is yeah is pretty staggering and a bit like you i get asked questions about the live events we have a team that does that i won't yeah. say i'm not involved because i am you're much more involved a, than i am but we yeah. have a team that, that does that. i kind of get dragged into it yeah uh because it is such a tiring endeavor anyone who's run a you know you know, held a party yeah. or a wedding, we'll know how or, difficult events are. We've yeah. got several global ones of pretty sizable global events. It's yeah. a it's a very, very big endeavour, but it is worth it when you get people come up to you and say, I've this is brilliant, got right? off combustion in whatever form and yeah. I've got a bike or I've got an electric car or an electric van or I've, you know, got off gas. You know, some of the conversations we have are absolutely fascinating. It's so it's been a, it's been a really incredible, yeah. incredible ride and, we're we're uh, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of people in London uh, in a few days' time. That'll be very good. Now then, what about uh, let's talk about an election we know about that is happening because there's obviously likely to be one in this country, but we don't know when that's going to be. But in the United States of America, there's going to be an election. There could very well be uh, a new president who's already been a president. Could be either. I wouldn't want to guess, <laughs> but there's certainly one of them will have a very profound impact on the, the world that we're discussing just because of who he is and why he's decided to make that stand and it's sort of, you know 
anti-electric, anti-renewables, pro-coal, pro-oil, drill and burn, baby. Let's burn more stuff. Let's dig up more shit and burn it. You know, if he gets into power, what's going to happen and how how do we respond to that? Well, I think, you know, in this case, it, it may be a case of better the devil you know. Um, yeah. It's a very, very difficult subject. We have a lot of viewers in, in the US. Um, but if you're not in the US, you can't tune out from this. Yeah. We were talking with Quentin about a year ago about starting Stop Burning Stuff. Uh, and Quentin was of a view that, you know, the sort of ill wind, ill wind that was blowing in all the tabloids about electric vehicles might have quite a big positive, sorry, big negative effect, yeah. big impact on EV sales in in the UK. Uh, 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 and I felt he was right, but the extent to which he has been right has been uh, difficult to to see. You know, yeah. Um, and it all stems from our politicians. Um, and there's also an echo chamber. If yeah. you have a newspaper saying that EVs are going to collapse car parks, even though we know it's rubbish because we're in the interest, in the, in, uh, the, industry, in yeah. the industry, politicians are reading those headlines too. Yeah. Yeah. So it becomes a, you know, a, vicious, a vicious circle. And if you think the impact of the UK press and UK politicians has been bad, then I, I, I would say I'm afraid that I think Trump uh, and his campaign uh, and US press and digital media as well could actually have an even bigger negative impact, not just on America, but in the UK, we tend yeah. to follow the US to a, to a certain extent. So already you can see the misinformation engines being fired up uh, by Trump. Um, the irony is visible from space in that he's worried about manufacturing uh, yeah. in the US he talked about American carnage in his first inauguration. And he, in fact, is potentially going to bring that about, you know, the fact yeah. that there won't be much manufacturing there because they're going to, you know, try and prevent the growth of electric vehicle manufacturing. Uh, the Chinese car market, as is, is already being weaponized in his speeches. He's always been talking yeah. about, you know, not letting BYD cars manufactured in Mexico in, in, into right. to the U.S., yeah. Um, so we know this is going to be a, a huge, huge issue uh, for the US and for those countries that follow the US closely. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to do more with Stop Burning Stuff in, in North America. Right. Uh, we have just started talking to uh, a group over there, an incredible group called uh, Republicans for EVs. Just We've done great. some phenomenal so work encouraging to hear that. understanding yeah. you know, Republicans' attitudes towards EVs. Yeah. And it's not as black and white as you might right. think. A lot of no, them of really, yeah. really like EVs yeah. and really pro-EVs, but it's a very, very complicated marketplace. So as it stands, we expect, expect Stop Burning Stuff will also probably have a, a launch event in Washington, D.C., uh, later this year and hopefully we can use our experience of you know uh, combating myths about electric vehicles we can use our experience to actually help them do the same in North right. America and maybe maybe just play a very very tiny part in in, in making people look at the actual facts rather than the alternative yeah. facts because uh, that election in November it seems to me is well I can think of very few elections in the in in the western world that have had more significance than the one that's coming up in, in November this year. Yeah, it's, it's hard, isn't it? It's just, yes, I don't know. I don't know how to judge it. Because, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think while well, I pick up on all these weird... There's, 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 there's no way of finding a kind of balanced middle way. There's an extreme anti-Trump sort of really, you know, I can understand it, terrified response. But there's also an extreme... The, the pro-Trump one is just as they're just. I can't understand what they're even talking about. They're just barking mad. So it's really hard to then feel which is likely to win. I can't. Do, you've got to be an American, and even even the pundits who study things like polls, they don't know. I mean, so we just have to wait and see. It, yeah, speculation is just what what we're doing now. We we don't know for certain. I mean, I think there'll be plenty of people that will be frustrated with Biden. Yeah, on a number of different levels, and and we're not American, so you know it's not not up for us to say that. Obviously, yeah. his landmark policy in this area has been the Inflation Reduction Act, the the, the IRA, yeah. which has largely been successful. But anything like this is a two edged sword, yeah. and he has, through policy levers, subtly tried to slow down uh, the kind of inundation of overseas manufactured yeah. cars into America 
with a scalpel. But I think that Trump will try to do the same with a sledgehammer, yeah. and I do worry about the effects of that. Yeah. Yes. On that. <laughs> on that incredibly happy. Note, <laughs> on that lovely note, we'll uh, we'll wind it up. But that, I mean, it's been great to catch up, Dan. Thank you very much for for explaining quite a few things to an old man. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just lovely to to see you. You know, you know these things that are that, that are going on. It is, you know, from my perspective, all the more reason that we need to, you know, yeah, keep promoting these technologies. You well, know, because that's, that's online, of, physically, uh, we need to get out there, and we and, need other people to help us do that. Because that's know? one of the things I'd forgotten that happened during the last Trump administration was the, you know, it was all the, the negative stuff about all that about renewables in particular. It was like it's, you know, we, these. We, they, but they murder birds, all that stuff. I don't even want to do it. But what happened was all these cities in America made commitments to go 100% renewable. They bought electric buses, and, they, that, and that's still happening. That, that's the flip side of the despair, is actually what it does often is it galvanises people into action rather than just talking about well, it. Well, let's try this great. as a positive thing. Okay, you know, politicians have a lot of power. They can actually slow things down. They yeah. can actually send the right signals that make a big difference. But fundamentally, cities can go their own way. Yeah corporations can go their own way citizens can go their own way they can make a massive massive difference yeah. and actually this is a global mega trend that trumps politicians yes. it really does yeah. but we shouldn't be naive to the fact that obviously people yeah. are aware now this is not a blip on the radar anymore yeah. if oil usage is going to go down you're going to see more and more of this thing yeah. so if you're on the side of cleaner technologies then we need to Double, triple, or step efforts. up to the plate. Step up and walk do towards the what was the, even more. Walk towards the gunfire. Walk fire. towards the gunfire. God, <laughs> let's be brave. Yeah, but we can we can make a difference. Yeah. So for anyone who's listening to uh, to this, please you know help us to do that. Yeah, and I mean, uh, in the, just to say, if you're in the UK or in the southeast of the UK, uh, and uh, please do come along to Everything Electric Live at XL on the. 28th, 29th, 29th and 30th, 30th of March, very soon. Um, and we've just done an episode, special episode on the Elizabeth Line, because you can actually get to London Excel now on the Elizabeth Line. So easy. From Reading in 60 minutes, Heathrow in about 40 minutes, Central London Central. in 20 minutes, and yeah. the team have just gone on a race. Yes, on the train I haven't seen this yet. And very electric excited. bike and electric car. I think that episode is going to drop any day now. Very good. Very exciting. So that's all. Uh, please, I'm not even going to do the, talk about subscribing because you should have done already, but I do tell your friends about this podcast and the shows and the live events. Uh, spread the word as much as you can. We're very grateful when you do. And as always, if you have been, thank you for listening. <laughs>